Good morning. Um, thanks to Adam and Anna for, and everybody for reading the Bible passages there. Um, so here we are back in the book of Isaiah. And this time we have a little bit of a change up because most of what we've already gone through is a lot of poetry of, and stuff. And now we're getting into some like, historical narrative. And if there's a historical narrative, it's nice to know the background of that history. And so Israel, in the case of poor planning, is stuck between the two big empires at the time, Egypt to the south and Assyria to the northeast. And then to the east and west, we have the ocean. So there really isn't a lot of place for them to go. But when times are good, they could sort of play off Assyria and, and Egypt and remain mostly independent. And this is not one of those times. Um, it kind of reminds you of uh, sort of like being Poland during not, between Nazi Germany and Russia, or in current times, think of Ukraine stuck between NATO and Russia. And in like modern times, Israel was just about to be invaded from from their northern neighbor who, who outgunned them. So here we are, it's 70, 701 BCE, and King Snacherab of Assyria is on the war path. Um, he's from now, uh, was now Iraq and Iran, and he's pushed west and then coming down south. Um, the previous couple of years, he'd attacked and attacked and annexed 10 northern tribes, and now he's on Israel's doorstep. And so shortly before us, our story, um, Judah had tried to pay off the Assyrians. Uh, they gave them 30 talents of gold and 300 talents of silver. And that much gold and silver would be worth about 90-ish million dollars today. So, you know, a decent chunk of change. But of course, the Assyrians took the money and didn't stop. Um, they went back on their word and they started attacking a whole pile of the cities all around, all around Jerusalem. And so, by the time we get to chapter 36, most of Judea has, has already been captured by the Assyrians. So we just did the quick little bit of uh, chapter 36, but the, the short rundown of it is King Snacherab is hanging out with his army a ways out, and he sends his rabbi Kishin, which is like his top official, to come chat. And he meets with the Judean officials. So long story short, he taunts them for a little while, tells them they're stupid to stand against the Assyrians, and that none of the other gods of any other cities around have been able to resist them, and neither will the Lord of Judah, Judea. Sorry. And then he turns to the locals and tells them quite graphically that they will have to eat their own excrement and drink their own urine, which sounds so lovely. Um, and then in verses 16 and 17, like he says to the people standing around going, do not listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me and come out to me. Then each of you will eat fruit from your own vine and fig tree and drink water from your own cistern until I come and take you to a land like your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards. So basically he's telling them, if you surrender, I will kick you off the land, but I'll take you someplace nice. So the officials return to Hezekiah to tell him what, what's gone down. So before we get a little further into this, maybe a quick background on King Hezekiah. So he's the 13th king after the king of Judah and Israel split. Um, to put it mildly, most of the kings of Israel and Judah were just horrible. Um, and, I, and when I say they were bad kings, it's not like they had like bad tax policies or extravagant spending. No, no, some of these people were literally sacrificing babies on mountaintops. So yeah, they were just the worst. But Hezekiah shows up and he turns back to God. He gets rid of the idols, he re rebuilds the temple and reforms the priesthood, restarts the Passover and other religious festivals, he builds fortifications around Jerusalem, he has a new water supply added inside the city wall. Um, he even tried to mend relationships with the ten tribes in the north. Plus they had, had a, like a little mini golden age. There was a bump in literacy at the time, there were several written works that came out of it during, out during his reign. So overall probably the best king they've had in centuries. So this is a little, when I'm doing research, this is a little side I thought was really cool. So these two little tablets, they're just little tiny things. And they were found in a bakery just around the corner from where the temple would have been. And so the first, the first one on the left there, has, it's got the, like the wing thing on it. Um, that one's definitely King Hezekiah's snap. Like it's a little snap with his name on it and stuff. And the, uh, the other one, it says, 
it says Isaiah, and then it's kind of a broken off, but it has the first couple letters of his hometown. So it's probably the Isaiah we're talking about here. But what these tags were used for is they were at the bakery. So if you went in, ordered your baking for the day, they would put the, like when your order was done, they put the little tag on, on the, on your order. It's like, it's like going to Batesy's ordering a cake and they put your little name sticker on it. So I just thought this was kind of cool. Like these are like real people going through real life ordering bread. Um, yeah, it just makes it a little more real to me. But sorry, getting back to, or sorry. Um, so the officials come back from meeting with, meeting with the Assyrians and they tell Hezekiah what happened and everyone, and understandably, everyone freaks out. Um, the thing is, Judah had saw the exact same thing happen to the northern kingdom two years earlier. And there's no way they could stand up against the military of the Assyrians. So he prays and he gets his officials to pray. And Isaiah, who also hears the report, prays and he prays too. And he says, so now, Lord, O Lord, save us from Sennacherib's hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. And the news is good. Isaiah sends a message, or I'm sorry, uh, God talks to Isaiah, and Isaiah sends the message to Hezekiah. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, because you have prayed to me concerning Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. And if you, we read the, all the all verses, and it's basically uh, from 21 to 29, there's this big list of the horrible things that are going to happen to, to the Assyrians. And what happens? Well, first off, the Assyrians leave. Um, the biblical account says, but the angel of the Lord coming through the camp and destroying hundred and some thousand, wherever it was. Um, the Greek historian Herodotus, Herodotus has an account where he talks about the Syrians had like multitudes of mice in their mice in their camp, which caused their defeat. So maybe a mouse plague, yeah, I don't know. Um, but the Assyrian account just simply says, as for him, Hezekiah, fear of my lordly brilliance overwhelmed him. And then they left. And in their account, they really don't say why. They just said, we, we're great, we're awesome, and then we left. Um, although, I did find a quote from one of the story, and he said, In view of the general note of boasting which pervades the inscriptions of the Assyrian kings, it's hardly to be expected that Sennacherib would record such a defeat. Whatever the exact detail was, the Assyrians left. The same Assyrians who had taken over most of the Judean cities already, had a, they had a massive army outside Jerusalem's gates, and they left. They left, went home, and never came back. And like it's mentioned in the reading today, that 20 years later, Snackrub was murdered by two of his sons, was replaced by a third, and then within a few decades after that, the whole Assyrian Empire, which had lasted for 1,400 years, just fell apart and was gone. And so that's sort of the, the, king, the, the big kingdom picture. But also in chapter 38... We get, it gets a little more personal. So this is two, three years later, and Hezekiah is in his early 30s, and he gets sick, and he's on his deathbed. Um, Isaiah comes to him and tells him, you know, you need to set your affairs in order because you're going to die. And again, Hezekiah's response is to pray. Please, O Lord, remember how I have walked before you in faithfulness and with a whole heart, and have done what is good in your sight. And again, God hears Hezekiah's prayers. He's healed, and he's given another 15 years. And this time it's Hezekiah that writes the long poem and, and the, joys, well, the joys of not being dead. And he ends with, Lord will save me, and, he will play, and, I, and we will play my music on stringed in instruments all the days of our lives at the house of the Lord. So he's happy, he's joyful, he wants to play good songs. And if you, you probably noticed the parallel in the two stories. In 37, the king was about to be overrun, and in 38, the king's about, die, about to die. But in both cases... Hezekiah's response is to pray. And in both cases, in both cases, praise to God, what situation? And in both cases, Isaiah comes with, back with message from God and tells him, you know, things are going to be, things are going to be, God has heard your prayer and things are going to be okay for now. To paraphrase something Brad said from last week, is that the kingdom was good until it wasn't. And Hezekiah was good until he wasn't. Later on, uh, Hezekiah starts to mess up a bit. And then his kids and grandkids really mess up a bit, a lot. Um, and same with the kingdom. The kingdom was doing good for a while. And then after Hezekiah's reign, it really started to fall apart. And within 100 years or so, they were conquered by the Babylonians. 
Now we're going to jump forward and forward 700 years from Isaiah's time to a time where a new empire is in control of Jerusalem. This time it's the Romans. And it's the evening of the Last Supper. And Jesus and his disciples are on the Mount of Olives, and Jesus knows he's about to die. And like Hezekiah, he prays to God. But he does it look differently this time. In chapter 22, he says, He knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. If you remember Hezekiah's prayer, I, I've walked before you in faithfulness. If anyone can say this, it's Jesus. But he doesn't ask for something for himself. He doesn't ask to be saved for the short term. Obviously, Jesus isn't really excited about the prospect of being killed, but he also realizes that this is how God is going to fix the problems of not being good enough, and, of being good enough until it isn't. So over the course of the next few hours, um, Jesus is betrayed by one of his closest friends, and his other friends run away and deny he even exists, they even know him, and then his days gets much, much worse. He gets wrongly convicted, and then gets executed by, by torture. And so if you're watching from the other side, this looks bad, like it seems all is lost. But this is where the story becomes the opposite of Hezekiah's. Instead of short-term salvation and long-term decline in suffering, Jesus' story is about short-term suffering and then long-term salvation. Because three days later, Jesus rises from the dead. And even the disciples haven't quite figured out what this means yet. Because on the Sunday of his resurrection, one of the disciples says to the other, but we hoped he was going to redeem Israel. They're still expecting God to get rid of the Rome, have the Romans turn around and leave, like the Syrians did seven centuries earlier. That's not the case. And then Jesus shows up and says to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, but, that everything about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture and said to them, Thus it is written, that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that Repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed to his, in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. So it turns out Jerusalem's purpose wasn't to be the city that was to be saved from the Assyrians or the Romans, but it was the starting point of great news. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we finally get the king that, isn't, that, is, that is good enough until forever. So the rift between God and humanity has been healed. So instead of a goodish kingdom under Hezekiah that immediately falls apart upon his death, we have a perfect king that has died and rose again. A king that, a king that began in 30 CE but continues now forever. We may live in this weird intermediate time period where it's Jesus' work is done but it's not quite filled yet, but one day Jesus will return and fully implement the perfect kingdom where people and God can live together, where the king and the kingdom is forever good. So let us pray. Thank you, God, for coming to earth to fix the rift between us and you and to show us what a true and good kingdom looks like. And I pray that we may live in light of that and show the world that you have come for that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.